I wanted to share something from Proverbs chapter 15. Verse 9 says, The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves one who pursues righteousness. <clears throat> I wanted to share a few things about how I understand that we pursue righteousness. One of the things that, a principle that is, sticks in my mind um, a, lot, uh, a lot that somebody told me probably about a year ago was if... Um, if you find some truth, you have to make sure that it can be applied to a single mother of five. Otherwise, it may not be uh, a truth. <laughs> so um, I think that that's been a great principle that sticks with me because it keeps me from a lot of things that are out there that sound good but aren't really um, truth. For example, um, hearing people say, you're not a Christian if you don't wake up and pray four hours in the morning every day to start the day off. You can't live with God <laughs> like that, or you can't if you don't pray hours a day, or um, when you, uh, you've got to have at least one retreat with God. If when you meet God, you need to get away with God for a month and spend some time alone with Him, away from everybody. Uh, these types of things. Um, I know that these aren't God's truth because can't apply it to a single mother of five, <laughs> these types of things. <laughs> so it's kept me from a, a lot of these things. I try to listen to a lot of sermons that are stirring, and I hear these things pretty often, sermons that um, uh, I think they're sincere people, are spoken with sincerity, but uh, I've, there are, there's still a lot of things out there that I kind of need to say, is that really pursuing righteousness, like this verse is talking about? God loves one who pursues righteousness. What is, does that really look like? pursuing righteousness. I think in man's eyes it does look like pursuing righteousness, but not in God's eyes. So um, I wanted to share a couple of things how, about how I believe that righteousness is formed in us and how we pursue it. And the first one uh, comes from Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, I'll stop right there. It, um, for Christ to live in me, the requirement is that I'm crucified with Christ. And so the way that I, really there's no righteousness that comes from me. All righteousness comes from Christ. And the way that I see that righteousness is formed in me is that I die and Jesus lives in me. Then it's his righteousness. That's the real righteousness that's pleasing to God. So the, the first thing I understand is that it's dying to myself. That is the pathway that's pursuing to right, the righteousness. And a single mother of five may not be able to pray four hours a day, but she can definitely die to herself. <laughs> and that any person that wants to follow God is able to do that no matter how much t free time they have during the day. They, if they're tempted with sin, they can choose not to sin. They can, they have a, they can make the choice and labor hard to deny themselves and um, choose to give up themselves in any situation. Um, I I think in a, in a lot of ways, uh, the mothers in the back, maybe they can't pay as much attention to the word that's spoken up here, but they have just as much, if not more, opportunity to die, die to themselves because, uh, and grow in godliness because they have to deny themselves in a sense. Like they have to, um, the people that, if you want to do something that, that you can't do and you give up of yourself, that's pursuing righteousness. That's a, um, a way that I see that um, spirituality doesn't necessarily look like uh, man always thinks it looks like. Like maybe spirituality to me might look like, oh, this person's taking a lot of notes. He's pursuing righteousness. <laughs> but um, maybe there's an unruly child in the back that um, somebody's chasing after, and that person <laughs> is pursuing righteousness because they're trying to make sure that other people aren't disturbed. There's two, both people, both pursuing righteousness. And it doesn't mean we can't pursue righteousness in here <laughs> just because we're in here and not denying ourselves as much as the people in the back. But every situation, the lesson I think is that every person in every situation, wherever they're at in life, has the opportunity to pursue righteousness. 
um, as much as anybody else. <clears throat> the next thing is that there's a, um, uh, another way I see is pursuing righteousness is that there's a rep the repentance and mourning over our sin is one way that we pursue righteousness. I've seen that when I really want to come to God and I see something that's wrong, maybe I don't feel so bad about it, but when I do see that it's wrong and I, so I pour out my heart to God and I try to take it seriously and say, Lord, sorry, I didn't, this didn't feel bad at the time. Maybe it doesn't even feel bad now, but I know it was sin, so I'm so sorry for it. I think that's the kind of um, thing that makes sin hurt more. It's kind of like a child who, it's the suffering that the, a child endures after touching a hot stove that will make them not want to touch the stove anymore. And I see there's a sense that I have to kind of foster that suffering over sin after I find myself falling into it and the mourning over it. Um, and I believe that's what the 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 is talking about, 10 and 11. I'll just read that, 2 Corinthians 10 and 11. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10 and 11. It says, um, sorry, I'll start at verse 9. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful uh, to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, and everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So the way I, the way I look at it is that repentance should look like that. Do I really have an uh, avenging of wrong that I'm set on making things right again because I hated the fact that I've fallen so much? Do I have a longing to make things right, a vindication? Um, one, one of the, the tests I've, I've seen that God gave me that I can know if I've really repented of something was if I could go back in time and live and sit, stand in my shoes and live that situation, the same situation over again, would I still make the same choice? And I believe that if I can honestly answer that I would not make the same choice, I would do it differently, I'd obey God, then that I can know that's, then I know I've truly repented of it. But if I, um, uh, that's why I, some, some people say, I'll just, I'm going to do the sin, I'll just repent later. But um, that person can't honestly say, if I could go back in time, I would make the same, uh, make a different choice. So we know that that's not real repentance. Somebody saying sorry, choosing to do something and just saying sorry afterwards. But repentance is if I have such a regret that I would make, I would definitely 100% make the same choice differently or make the, in the same situation, make a different choice then I can know that I've repented. And um, I kind of want to, uh, I want to take sin so seriously that I'm uh, I trying to make myself, I, I desire this longing to avenge my, the wrong that I've done, like in verse 11 right here. The other thing was that um, we heard an illustration a while back. It was how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the, the definition of that was kind of like um, we heard in our heart our heart has many doors in it, and we have to open up those doors for the light of the Holy Spirit to shine in, and the opening up of the doors is surrendering. And so the what we've come to understand in this church is that the surrender is the path to being filled with the Holy Spirit, the opening up of the doors of our heart and letting the Holy Spirit shine through. And I've, um, I've kind of seen that surrender is a... Um, it's a pretty hard thing just to say, to honestly say that my life is surrendered on the altar, that I don't... Um, consider my life mine anymore. And when I s see how serious that is, I don't know if I can honestly say that yet. Um, I've, uh, my dad's mom, my grandmother, she uh, had to raise, so I, I mentioned the single mother of five thing earlier, and she, she was, she kind of fits the bill because she was a single mother of five. Her husband left her and she had to raise five kids on her own. And, um, and the kids, they, um, had to uh, kind of 
look at her as the only one that was taking care of her. And so she had to work and take care of the kids. She had some help with, fam with family, but for the most part, the burden fell on her shoulders. And I was kind of thinking about what her life was like, such a hard life. I had some time with her a few weeks back, and I was talking to her and asking her. And um, she has such a wonderful spirit, and I can't help but think the, with what she's had to surrender of her life, it's no wonder that she has such a wonderful spirit. She, this was a life that I can look at and say, wow, she really did have to put it on the altar, raising 25 kids alone for 20 years or whatever, basically waking up early every day, getting them ready, getting food ready, making sure they're ready for school so they can walk to school, going to work, coming home, raising them the right way, disciplining them, cooking food, and then going to bed late and getting a little bit of sleep and going, doing that over the next day for 20 years in a row. And her life basically was not hers for the whole time that her kids lived with her. And um, I, when I look at that, I say, boy, I can't say that my life is surrendered to God like that. My life is not, I still consider my life mine because I'm waiting for the point where Isaac is old enough and Juliana is old enough where I can relax again. <laughs> I can uh, come home and eat and um, enjoy like dinner. <laughs> uh, but um, like there's still this kind of waiting, like this period of like I'm just waiting for life to get easy. But that, um, that showed me um, my life really isn't surrendered. And so I've, uh, I've got to have the mindset that even would I be okay if God showed me that I need, had 20 years ahead of nothing but nonstop work from morning till night, would I be okay? A slave is okay with that because his life isn't his anymore. But if I don't have that mindset, then I'm, I can't really consider myself a slave to God. I can't really consider my life surrendered. And so um, God is showing me that uh, a surrendered life, it, uh, I've got to be ready to give up myself in every situation and not necessarily have this, not make my hope the hope that I'm um, going to have things easy one day, but the hope that I can grow in godliness and do what God's called me to do. And... Um, I just wanted to close with the one verse that stuck with me that shows that Paul had this exact mindset. And that's verse in Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He said, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish the course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of, to the gospel of the grace of God. He, Paul, his mindset was, I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Another translation says, I consider my life worth nothing to me anymore. And um, boy, that's a, that goal is pretty far away for me. Um, but I, that's, that's the goal I want to get to. And that's the goal that God has shown me that I need to get to. And um, a surrendered life is much uh much different, I think, a much different mindset. But I think it, even though it's a, it's a different mindset, I don't think it's a burden. I, I think that when I, do, when I do surrender everything, I can have more joy and more peace than I'll ever have had if I was trying to cling on to something myself and even accomplish something myself. Um, I've seen that a lot of times I just want like a day to myself, but then when I, I find out when I do have a day to myself, I'm just sitting at home. I find myself bored and going out of my mind. Oh, I got to get out of here. <laughs> it's like, well, what I think I want for myself is not really peace and joy. It's just what I, um, I'm trying to, the mindset that, that, that I have is often trying to replace God's peace and joy with something else. But uh, really when God's peace and joy can come, when I surrender my life and consider my life worth nothing to me and make God's, um, God's mindset, my, God's, um, uh, joy, my my joy. I, there's this acronym that I've I learned. It was uh, J O Y, and um, it was Jesus, others, and yourself. And so that's kind of the priority of make that my priority. Jesus, my first priority. Other people, my second priority. And myself, my third priority. And that's the pathway to joy. And um, I've uh, so that's my my goal that I've I the path that I'm on, and I hope that I can get there one day. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the words of life that you've spoken to us today. We pray that each one of us would be people who takes your words seriously, that wants to put them into practice, that we don't love to hear but walk away and forget everything, but we love to try to live what you 
speak to us, that our passion is your passion, Lord. That we would long to purify ourselves, to grow in grace. Father, thank you for this church, this local church. It is truly the body of Christ, Lord. We're in it together. Help us to rejoice together, to root for each other in our endeavor to become more Christ-like, to get close to you. Lord, help us to be a real family that cares for each other and um, longs to be with each other and uh, most of all, longs to see each other get close to you. Lord, we pray for a blessing on this church and for all who weren't able to make it today. We love you, Father, and we just thank you for the opportunity to be in the work that you've called us to do. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to have wonderful weeks. Keep us safe. And we uh, praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.